God for that. I still remember the baby there. Thank you, Zach. Any others? Remember a lot of people sick. I was just telling Dad they're dropping like flies at school. So just walk around with Germex and Lysol and hope for the best. <laughs> Be me. Be sure to remember her. She's having cataract surgery tomorrow. Any others? Yes, be sure to remember her. Dieter with Dustin was my quarterback at Pound and kind of like my third son. He stayed with me and Bob a lot through high school and I went to Texas, was the best man in his wedding and everything else. But uh, it's his papa basically one that raised him and he passed away with cancer last weekend. So you should remember that family. I think he came home yesterday or day before or something like that, I think. Yeah, yeah I'd seen uh, some people from Ridgeview put that on, so be sure to remember him, remember that family. Remember Renee. No other, I'm sure we all have unspoken requests. But I'll we'll come to the altar tonight and pray or pray where you're at. Uh, ask Brother Carmel if he will.
Good evening again. Um, desire your prayers tonight as we as we stand. I'm uh, going to go and do another lesson out of the how happiness happens, and it's kindly uh, another one of those that where uh, last couple weeks knew I was teaching and you know had been reading and have read this book, and uh, it just seems how God kind of orchestrates everything together and everything that I study and read kind of kept coming back to this. Um, so the chapter we'll do tonight or the, the lesson that kind of comes from this and uh, not everything's from the book and some of it is, but uh, it's your serve. And going to talk about service, uh, serving others. And, you know, uh, that is that is our ultimate role. A lot of people and for a long time would sit idly by myself and go church, do a little here, do a little there, because you just didn't really know what God's will in my life was. But if you're struggling for what God's will in your life is, it's to love and to serve other people. Point blank. That's it. Uh, in different capacities. Now, he may call you into a special, if you want to call it a special role, uh, or whatever else, or put a calling on your life that specifically deals with that. But in whatever capacity of life you're in right now, your God-given duty as a Christian uh, is to serve, is to be a servant, okay? And that's what we're going to look at tonight. So if you have your Bibles and you want to turn, we'll be in Luke, but first of all, we're going to look here in Galatians, okay? Galatians 5 and 1 says this, Stand therefore, or stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free. Be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. And then Galatians 5 and 13 says, For brethren, you've been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you again for the privilege of being in your house. God, we pray you just bless your word. God, Lord, that during this lesson, God, you keep me out of the way. God, Lord, and you, you would open all of our hearts, God, Lord, that we could be better servants for you. God, Lord, that we can be agents of change, uh, that we can love and encourage those that we come in contact with. Lord, bless our time together. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, so we see here a couple different uh, occasions in Galatians talking about liberty, freedom, okay? Uh, and, we, you know, we hear a lot about freedom, and I think about the tax commercial, free, 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 and the guy's doing the uh, crossword puzzle, and it's free, free, and then he gets stuck, and his wife comes by and says, free, ah, oh, free, and he writes it down. That was kind of my thinking uh, when I was reading these uh, verses here. But, but you are free, okay? And then I thought, too, well, we'd ask us question, are we free? Are you free? Because a lot of times we'll wear our Christian badge, I'm free, free from sin. But we allow other things to entangle us, okay? You know, yes, as a Christian, we are free from, uh, we are free. We are free from sin. We should be free from guilt. We should be free from rules we should be free from regulations. And I put should in those because I think a lot of times um, God's not getting the full working out of us because we're carrying around guilt. Or maybe we're carrying around rules or regulations and we're trying to do stuff to earn something. Okay? But the second part of that verse says the yoke of slavery is off and, and if you if you know a, what a yoke is you know that's the thing that they would uh, use usually for oxen uh, I think you know for the horses and mules and things like that they would use more of a harness which was kind of more of an independent you know you put around their neck and run the leads through and the other one would be one and then something with the wagon or something would tie them to together but a yoke was more or less just a big old carved out log, more or less, with two things that they would put around the neck, and so they were bound together, okay? And, and so that's what he's saying here, that the yoke of slavery is off. We're not slaves to these things anymore. We're not designed to be a slave to guilt, a slave to shame, a slave to rules and regulations or religion. We're free from all of those things, all right? Because if you go back to other, some, a lot of the other things that Paul writes, he does a lot of comparing and contrasts. If you're free from the law, then. 
you know, and he talks a lot about circumcision and uncircumcised and all this stuff here and, and ties that into the law, but we're no longer bound by the law, that we are free from those things. And, and, and I don't know, I think the Lord speaks to me through, speaks to me through YouTube a lot. Uh, and, and I'm serious because just the last week or two from mine and Bob's conversations to things we go through, through, you know, and, and sharing with each other and stuff like that. And so last night, if I, I, you know, sat down, watch TV, whatever, and, and I was just, I was going through YouTube and looked at it and, and seen, you know, what was on, and I usually listen to music off of it or something like that, and there was a sermon popped up, and it's Robert Morris, the, if you came and did any of the couples fellowship, he was the guy that did those. And so it was a guy at Robert Morris's church, but it wasn't him, and he was sharing a sermon on... Um, I've changed my mind about worry, guilt, worry, anxiety, and fear. I think is what it was. So I sat down. It was about thirty minutes. So I sat downstairs, listened to it, and Bob was up getting ready for bed. And uh, and I said, "Wow, you know." And it, it was just spot on. It's covering a lot of things that me and her was talking about. So I took it up. I was like, "Here, you need to listen to this." And uh, I wasn't saying, "Here, you need to listen to it." <laughs> it would help her. It, it was it was beneficial to me. And so I, then I laid there in bed, and, and we listened to it again to, uh, together. And that was kind of what his thought was. You know, a lot of times we'll use that, well, I just can't get over this, or I can't get past this, or I can't stop worrying about this. And, and he makes a statement in that sermon that really just, wow, you know, it's one of those, I really never thought of it that way. But the peace that we experience in life is, is, the, is us knowing that God's presence is near but he said worry, fear, and anxiety in our life is letting us know that the devil is near. And I thought, wow, that is so true. And I mean, it's not something that's saying the devil's got control of us because we have worry, fear, and anxiety in our life. That's not what he's saying. But it just lets us know that, hey, you know, like the devil, like the um, God says in Luke here that, you know, he's, he's waiting at the door. He's crouching. And he's, he's following every single one of us, looking for the right time to pounce on us in some capacity. And he said, so when you are going through those things, then, yeah, the devil's there. But the joy of it is, is that we are free from that. And he says in our two, whatever the thing that you're worrying about, the anxiety in your life and the things that's, he said, that should become your prayer list. Instead of worrying about it, pray about it. And he talked about, you know, the old timers talking about we're going to pray through this, you know, that we're going to be committed to prayer until God gives us our answer. Um, and there's a lot of good things in that that kind of ties into this yoke of slavery. You know, that we're not tied to guilt. I mean, the Bible, God's greatest commandment throughout his word is fear not. It's in there more than any other commandment in there. Okay? And God will never command us something that he hasn't given us liberation from to begin with. He's not going to say fear not, and yet us not be able to overcome fear in our lives. We can overcome it. Um... It's hard. It's hard. And it's something that the devil, it's the number one tool used by the devil. Fear and anxiety. And because of that, it's the number one prescribed medicine from doctors. So it's something we all, we all deal with. Okay? But it says here that the yoke of slavery is off. And because we are free, we can serve. Because the hardest thing about not being able to serve is not being free. Most people that, I won't say grow idle, but maybe sit down in the church and maybe not as active as they once were, is because I, a lot of times, and I don't know the whole discernment thing. Uh, I mean, I know what discernment is, and I think sometimes God gives me intuition. Um, but a lot of times people are going through things, and because of guilt, because of shame, because of whatever else. They just don't feel they can serve no more. And again, it goes back to being a tool of the devil that, you know, if we're not free, we can't serve. And God says you're free, and he frees us of all these things. Why? So we can do what we are created to do, and that is serve. Okay? So don't let the devil lie to you and chain you to whatever it is. Guilt, shame, or whatever it might be. 
Christ's work on the cross frees us of those things, okay? And he doesn't free us so we can live a glorious life. He frees us of those things so we can live a life that brings him glory. And there's a big difference. There's a big difference because for a long time, I struggled with the ideal of, well, God, I'm doing this, 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 and this, and this. I shouldn't be dealing with these things. But my life is his to bring glory to him. Glory awaits all of us. But we're not going to find glory in this world. If we do, we might need to check ourselves. Or as John Chris would say, you need to check your heart. Because if you're finding joy and glory in this world, we may live, be living as the world. Okay? And so a couple analogies here that, that are people that um, Max uses in the book and he talks about. Andrew. So if I were to do this slide the way I meant to and just had Andrew's name up there and not all these other things listed, I would ask you the question, what do you know about Andrew? Well, he's in the Bible, wasn't he? And he was, uh, you know, and we'd go through and we, you might have been able to list all these things. I couldn't. But through studying, you find that he's a brother of Peter. He came from the same town as James and John, the sons of Zebedee. He was quiet, but he was not complacent. Okay, he's the kind of the behind-the-scenes guy. He led his brother to Jesus. He led Peter to Christ. Okay, it was Peter, though, that if I said, what can you tell me about Peter? He walked on water. He was always one, you know, to do all these things here. And, you know, he preached the very first sermon, and he wrote two epistles, and and everything else. And then he, Paul also, uh, he was a defender of Paul. So he was kind of like a forerunner and, and worked along with Paul and leading into Paul's work. And so we would know a whole lot more about Peter and we would know a whole lot more about Paul than we do Andrew. But Max starts off this chapter and he talks about, I don't know his name. He said he was built, built like a cinder block. He was a little short, squatty man. He said he wore khaki pants button-up shirt, short-sleeved, and a tie. And he was my Sunday school teacher. He said in fourth grade, he taught the boys. He said in one day he taught on Romans, chapter 7. He said, I have no idea what all he was talking about. He said, because he was spitting and sputtering and not a very good speaker. He said, but I came home that night and I started asking Dad about heaven because he mentioned some things that struck my curiosity. My dad set me down on the bed, started telling me about grace. He said, and because of that, I was saved. Now Max Licato is written, probably one of the best-selling Christian authors there is. He's been a senior pastor at a church in Texas for 30-plus years. He said, to this day, I still don't remember who that man was. He said, but God does. And he probably went home feeling defeated. Those kids, they ain't listen to me. I'm giving up that class. There's no need. Those boys have no interest in anything, and I'm not a very good teacher. But behind the scenes, God used whoever that man was to, you know, spark a great light in the Christian community to this day that still, you know, is burning very bright. Same thing would be said about Andrew. We don't know as much about him, but we see when God used his work when he was just a servant and, and took off the yoke of bondage. He could say, I'm not this, I'm not that. He took all of that off and God did great things through it. So it may not be you, it may not be me that, you know, sees the end results of it, but that kid that you've taught or that kid that you're teaching or that meal that you might prepare, that word of encouragement that you might share, you don't know what God can do with that. So don't sell yourself short and say, well, what I do don't matter. What you do doesn't matter, but what you do for God's glory matters greatly and can have eternal significance for it. Look at Mary. You know, what do we know about Mary? She was Jesus' mother, okay? But it still don't tell us a whole lot about that. You know, if you look at her credentials, she's not a scholar. She wasn't one of the social elites of the day, okay? She was very simple. She was plain. She was a peasant. She was from Nazareth. Nazareth was that little Galilean town that, you know, and I would call out places from around here, but you might live there, so I don't want to insult nobody, you know. 
It's just one of those places you go through because you have to pass through it to get to you know, another place. And that's where she was from. And you would think that if you're going to bring Jesus into this world as a baby, you might do a little better background check than Mary. You know, just this young, poor little girl from this insignificant place. But again, God chose her. Why? Because God looks at that on the inside, okay? And, and you look at her, she's a Jew. So she had always been subject her entire life. Because she was a Jew, she was subject to what the Romans said because the Romans occupied the area where she lived at that time. Because she was a female, she didn't have any rights and was subject to whatever the male said. Because she was young, she was subject to what the elders told her to do. And because she was poor, she was subject to what the rich would always tell her to do. Okay? But listen to what she says right here in Luke 1 and 38. Let me find it here. 38. It says, And Mary said, Behold, the handmaid, or you could say the servant of the Lord, be it unto me accordingly to thy word. And the angel departed from her. So when the angel come, Mary didn't pull out her list and say, God, are, are you sure? I, I, I'm not very well schooled. I'm nobody in society. I'm simple, plain, and a peasant. I can't whatever it is you want me to do. You know, maybe you should go and try to find a Roman. You know, maybe a little older female with a little more knowledge than me. Okay? Someone with some money or whatever. She didn't say those things. What did she say? As your servant, as your handmaid, okay, I'll do it. And, and I think about it in our own life if we would just take that approach. A lot of times we'll barter with God, right? I can't because we're going to list the failures. We'll list the guilt. We'll list all these other reasons. But if we would take Mary's approach and say, as a servant of the Lord, I'll do it. You know, I'll, you know, you talk about putting your, going out on the limb. I talked about the last time. Mary definitely went out on the limb. Okay. <laughs> but a lot of it comes back to eye trouble. And for those of you that um, been here several years, I don't know how many years ago it was, but it was a long time ago. And, and we did a play. And I remember the kids singing something about eye trouble. I trouble is my trouble and it's getting out of hand. I was in it. I don't even know who it was, but I was in that play and the kids sung that song. That's the only thing I remember out of it. Um, but, but a lot of the times we have eye trouble and it's not this eye trouble, but eye trouble, me, me. And it, it's, it's a sin to, be, to have eye trouble, to be arrogant, self-elevated. In other words, we're always, it's all about me or entitlement, you know, and Max tells the story here of a parking lot, and it's one that I can pretty much verbatim relate to. He says he's, it's Christmas, you know, he's doing his last minute shopping, and, you know, it's the Christmas holidays and stuff like that. And so he's circling through the mall, waiting for the best parking spot, and, you know, one comes available. So he's sitting there patiently waiting for it, and, you know, he's waiting for him to back out, and here's my thing, you know, I, I got to hurry, I need to get to this. I've got to be at church in 30 minutes. I need to go and be having this done. I've got to get this. I've got to run back and go and do, you know, he, <coughs> he was going through his mind. All the things that he had to do. He said, as soon as that car backed up, here comes one the other direction and jerk, went in the parking spot. And so he was like, do they know who, what they just did? You know, God's grace was shining upon me because here he is a pastor and all these things here. And... You know, he, he purposely opened up that parking spot just for me to take because God's favor's on me, you know. He said, so I'm going to drive by and give this person a piece of my mind. He said, and slowly went by, said she got out of the car and said, hey, Pastor Max, can't wait to see you at church on Sunday, <laughs> you know. And he said, I just kind of drove on by, thankful that I didn't get my window down enough to tell her what I was going to think, you know. But, but me, me, you know, and so many times, a lot of the troubles that we get into is because of the arrogance. And I'm not talking about arrogance thinking around, you know, higher than ourselves than we maybe should, but, but we all have, I think, at times a sense of entitlement 
well, I deserve this, or I don't deserve this. You know, and it's easy to preach that, and I've said that before, you know, God saved us, and if he never did nothing else for us, we could say we've been blessed. And that's true. But get sick. God, I, I don't have time to be sick. I don't know why I've been sick for so long. I don't know why it's always me. I don't know why my family's always sick. I don't know why we're going through all these things. I don't know why. Self-elevation. You know, we're putting ourselves up there and saying, God, I just really don't have time for none of this. You know, got some numbers here for you. Talking about eye trouble, okay? You take eye trouble, and all of us are guilty of having some eye trouble from time to time. If you're not, altar's open. You come over here and pray, ask for forgiveness, and we'll continue on with this lesson. But we all have some eye trouble, okay? At 3... 05, 2.35, somewhere in that time, sometime during fourth block, I went on the world population clock, okay? And it was going up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down these last three or four digits over here the whole time. It was showing you how many people was dying at that time, how many people living at that point in time. It's kind of scary. But anyway, at that time, there were 7,760,861,435 people populating the earth. So you take 7 million, or 7 billion, 776 million, you know, so forth, so on. You know what I'm talking. People with eye trouble, and most of us don't have just one episode a day. Average person has at least 12 episodes of eye trouble a day. So you take 1 times 7.7 7 billion times 12, it equals a messy world. A messy world. A bunch of entitled people who feel it's all about me, people. Shine the lights down, here I come. You know? And then guess what? When somebody don't shine the lights upon us and we have some heartaches and troubles along the way, what do we do? We get mad at God. Or we get mad at those people who didn't give us what we deserve. But if we take on the role of I'm here to serve, and we take our troubles off of me and put it on them, then we're fulfilling the purpose that God has set for each one of us. Okay? And if you go into <coughs> Matthew 20, and I think I got it up here, yeah. Matthew 20, 20. Okay? This is not a modern day problem. This is something that's been around for quite some time. We was talking earlier about the sons of Zebedee. It says, and then came to him, coming to Jesus, the mother of Zebedee's children, with her sons, worshiping him and desiring a certain thing of him. And he said unto her, What wilt thou? And she said unto him, Grant that these my two sons, fine and outstanding boys they are, they've been with you for quite some time now, Lord, may they set one on thy right hand, the other on thy left, in thy kingdom. But Jesus answered and said, Ye know not what ye ask. You're able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of and be baptized with the baptize, baptism that I am baptized with. Then they said unto him, We are able. And he said unto them, Ye shall drink indeed of my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to set on my right hand or on my left hand is not mine to give. But it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared of my father. <coughs> You ever have those days where you think you probably should be sitting right there at the right hand of God? You know, and that's, like I said, before we look at the shame, the guilt, the fear, the anxiety, the things that we yoke ourselves to that drags us back. But on the other hand of the spectrum, we think, well, I probably should be at the right hand of God. I'm the only person in that church cares cares any least bit. I work with all these miserable people that hates me and life and everything else. I'm the only ray of sunshine there is. That's what the mother of uh, James and John thought. And God, you, you just go ahead and make a space for them right there on one on your right hand and one on your left hand. He said, you, you don't know what you're asking. Okay? Because they've walked with Jesus does not mean that they're entitled to sit at the right or at the left. He says, that's, that's God's choice. God will do that. He's just here to do the work of the Father. And if you go back and read to that, Jesus has just dedicated the last couple of chapters, especially there in Matthew 
of the role of a servant, <laughs> of, of what it is that we're supposed to do, you know, of being humble and girding our loins and putting an apron on and washing feet and, you know, doing all these things here. And then here comes James and John's mom saying, but these boys are special. And, and we do that a lot. We do that a lot. <laughs> Here's what Jesus tells us in Philippians 2 and 6. It says, Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Okay? So we're talking about Jesus. Leaving the splendors of heaven, part of the triune, you know, part of the Trinity coming right down here to earth. But made himself of no reputation, left heaven, came to Mary. Okay? And we just went over the, what Mary, who she was. All right? And took upon himself the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. All right, so he, he become a servant. He left the splendors of heaven to come down here with us. In Luke and 12, and I got it right here, and, and you could read a whole lot of this, um, but I want to read just a couple verses here. He starts off in Luke 12 and 31. And, and he's going back through, and he's talking about care and anxiety and tells them the par parable of the rich fool and all this stuff right here. And then Jesus tells them in verse 31, but rather... Instead of seeking after all these other things, he said, but rather seek ye the kingdom of God and all these things shall be added unto you. And then he goes on down and he tells them right here. There's verse 34, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. All right? Let your loins be girded about and your light burning. In other words, be ready. Be ready. And then he goes on down. He says, be therefore ready also for the Son of Man cometh at an hour when you think not. So he's, you know, you can't say, well, when it's time, I'm going to serve, okay? Or give me some time, Lord, and eventually I'm going to get everything right and I'm going to be dedicated and I'm going to serve you. He's saying, no, right now, gird your loins, get your lights ready to be shining. Why? So you can get to work. Why? Because you don't know when he's coming back. And we don't need to be found not doing when he comes back. Now, I'm going to read you... Um, and I've, I think I've quoted him the last several times, but I always have to go back through and see what did J. Vernon McGee says about these verses here. And here's what he says. He says, our world is entangled in commerce. Now, this book's written in the 1960s, late 60s, early 70s when he writes his commentaries. He's been dead for quite some time. But he says, our world is entangled or in, engaged in commerce. Half of the world is spent, uh, spends its heart's blood in building a better mousetrap while the other half will go to the ends of the earth to buy the mousetrap both groups are forgetting there is a God in heaven and that all men have an eternal soul and then he goes on to say all men will one day stand before an aw the awful presence of God stripped of all the things that occupied his life he will have no treasure up there because again, going back to what he says, where your heart is is where your treasure is. And if your heart's here and you're striving after all the things that this world has to offer, those things are going to be left and you're going to stand before God naked with nothing. Because he said all those things will have no treasure up there. He lived without God, he will die without God. And I thought, wow, that hurts. Because a lot of times we think, well, I'm a Christian and, and I told you before, you get saved and use it for fire insurance that... God just take me to heaven and I'll be well. But we forget that when he saves us that we become part of his glorification. And a lot of times we've spent a whole lot of time and there's a whole lot of time in my life that I've wasted striving for things of this earth. Some obtained, some didn't obtain. But guess what? If God would have called me away at that point in time, all that striving, I'd have left him right here on the face of this earth. And I'd have stood before him and he'd say, what have you done with my son? Well, I accepted him so I wouldn't go to hell. That didn't bring him no glory whatsoever. He said, I gave you a life to use for his upbuilding of his kingdom, for his glory. And, and so, again, you know, I know this is encouraging and how happiness happens, but striving, working, entitlement, all about me will make you a miserable soul. I've tried it. 
Because guess what? It's never going to be all about you. Never. Unless you want to be some little hermit and live off the grid in a cabin of one person. Because I don't care, you can bring whoever in that cabin with you and they ain't going to be all about you every single day. Matter of fact, most days if you're living there by yourself, you'll get tired of yourself pretty quick. Because we wasn't created to be about me. We was created to serve. So my last question for you, are you a Mo or a Joe? Okay? Are you a Mo or a Joe? And, and if you're if you used to watch the old shows on, I think it came on USA, there was a show called Pro vs. Joes, and that's just where professional athletes beat the far out of guys that thought they were, should be professional athletes. Uh, but here's what Mo says. Mo says, bring me, serve me, treat me, cater to me. Mo makes people unhappy that he's around. Mo's mad all the time, or at least 90% of the time. He'll have a good day. Once a week, maybe. Mo has very high expectations, okay? Driven, I got to get this, 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 and this done. I got to go and see this. I got to see that. Very high expectations. And Mo's seldom happy and slow to serve because he don't have time to serve because Mo's about me. I got to do this. Bring me my food. Serve me now. Treat me better. Cater to me. I need it. You know, or a Joe. Joe wakes up and says, who can I help? Who needs a little sunshine today? Look for people in need. If we go back to the other slides of 7.7 .7 billion people with eye trouble, it's not too hard to find people in need, okay? Give smiles. The best way for you to be happy is to make someone smile. Try it. It's proven. It's proven. You'll make it your habit through that day that I'm going to try to make, bring as many smiles on people's faces as I possibly can. For every person you make smile, I believe you'll smile two or three more times than them. Because, you, again, you can't be chained to a yoke of, you know, you can't walk in whew, airing your laundry and how mad you are at the world and then say, oh, yeah, by the way, hey, good morning. It don't work. But if you're free and you can go in in the morning and say, how you doing, and sincere about it, you can bring some smiles. You can give encouraging words. And it doesn't mean that every day you just feel, you know, sometimes you feel, I got to be uplifted some. I need some uplifting. But again, remember what we're created for. We're created to serve. And when we serve other people, it'll draw us up. It's biblical. Okay? It's biblical. <coughs> A positive attitude. Circumstances don't affect Joe. Because why? Joe's on a mission. Joe's on a mission to serve. And the circumstances, it don't matter. It don't matter. I mean, go on Samaritan's Purse trips or go to Nicaragua or go mow someone's yard and stuff like that. The circumstances, I mean, we was in Nicaragua a couple different times and just the heavens broke. Well, you're riding around the back of a pickup truck all the time, which feels like people shooting with BBs when they're driving fast. You know what? It didn't cut down on the servant. And guess what? Those people that was receiving, they was just as tickled to death as if the sun was shining. Probably more so because at that point in time they was in a severe drought and they celebrated the rain. <coughs> so Joe goes around and makes people smile. So which one are you? Isaiah 58 10 says, If thou draw, 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 try it again. If thou draw out thy soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul, then shall the light rise in the obscurity and in thy light and thy darkness be as the noonday. And the Lord shall guide thee continually and satisfy thy soul in drought and make fat thy bones. And thou shalt be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose water fell not. I want to read you a, not another version, but well, it is another version, but this is what how that the King, New King James put that. It says, The Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your soul in drought and strengthen your bone. You shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water, um, whose waters do not fail. Okay? In the first part of that, 
then your light shall be dawn in the darkness, and your darkness shall be as the noonday. And what he's saying is in this right here, if you give of yourself, God's going to take care and in replace give you everything you need. Okay? You're not going to run out of smiles. You won't run out of encouraging words. God will replenish those things. And he says, your darkness shall be as the noonday. That's it's never dark at noon. Okay? And he says, now does it continue? It says down here, and he'll satisfy thy soul in the drought. It means when you're going to go through some times and you're going to have to be replenished, but guess what? That God will always replenish you. What would happen if everyone took on the role of a servant? Okay? I want to finish with the last thing here. <clears throat> he tells a story, and it's a very fitting story. Um, and, and it's a very, I guess, lifelike story um, because it's the story of his dad, but it would be the story of my grandfather. And he says this right here. He says, what would happen if everyone took on the role of a servant? How many marriages would be blessed? If politicians set out to serve people more than to serve themselves with their country's benefit, if churches were populated by sincere servants, how many 10-year-old boys would hear the invitation of a lifetime? It says, in the hallway of my memory hangs a photograph. It's a picture of two people, a man and a woman. A couple in the seventh decade of life. It says, the man lies in a hospital bed, but not in a hospital it's in his room. His body, for all practical purposes, is useless. Muscles has been ravaged. They are stretched from bone to bone like the taunt fabric of the spokes of an umbrella. He breathes through a hose attached into the hole at the base of his throat. And even though his body is ineffective, his eyes are searching. They scan the room for his partner. A woman whose age is conserved by her youth for vigor. Her hair is gray, but she is vibrant and healthy in contrast to the figure lying in the bed. She's, she willingly goes out of her task of the day taking care of her husband. With, unserving, or with unwavering loyalty, she does what she's been doing for the past two years. It's not an easy assignment. She must shave him, bathe him, feed him, comb his hair, brush his teeth. She holds his hands and they sit and watch TV together. She gets up in the middle of the night to suction out his lungs. She leans over and kisses his feverish face. She serves him. She carries on the lineage of Andrew and Mary. And he says, and by the time my father took his final breath, the two had been married for more than four decades. He says, on the day we buried him, I thank my mom for modeling the spirit of Christ. Quiet, servitude. And I tell you, that's just, you know, we never know the capacities. And, and a lot of times we think, you know, God will call me to do something great or whatever else. But sometimes God calls us just to do the ordinary. And every day it gives us an opportunity. Maybe not to those extremes, and I, I pray not. But if so, take on whatever role that God gives us. That we can be encouragement to those in need and that we can love the way Christ loved. Because when we see ourselves as that quiet servant, we don't struggle from the eye trouble that this world and the devil wants us to be yoked to, to thinking it's all about me. And the hard part about it, I understand, okay? I understand. I'm not here to tell you that, you know, I beat this thing, but I'm coming to the conclusion of this. If you're going to beat the thing, if I'm going to beat the thing, you're not going to do it by yourself. Because we live in a world that fosters everything is about you. It's all about entitlement. Everybody should get a trophy just because you woke up. I'm here to tell you it's not that way in God's kingdom. Nowhere in his word does he say you're entitled to anything. Well, he does in Romans. For the wages of sin is death. And because of sin, we all deserve death. But the gift of God is eternal life. And because he gives us that gift, we're to make that light shine for others. Shine that light on other people.
through quite servanthood. You're not going to get your names in lights for doing some of the things you have to do. But I promise you this, God takes note of it. God takes note of it. And it comes down to we want to be a man pleaser or a God pleaser. And I'm trying to every day learn to become more of a God pleaser. And the key to that is I'm trying to become more. I'm not there. But God does daily remind me. And when I go through the attitude of my school day with the attitude of being a Joe and not a Mo, I like my job. I really like my job, you know. But when I take on the role of a mo, all I'm doing is sharing, dragging people through the sewer with me. Okay? Does anybody have anything? I pray you got something out of it. It may have only been for me. I appreciate you letting me teach myself tonight. Uh, but it, it, it is. It's just, you know, I always thought I was a happy person. But I was a happy person when the circumstances were right. And God's teaching me to be a happy person even when it's not the easiest thing. But if I look on the outside of what's going on in the world and not just always in my own life, then I can see a little bit more of what God's called me to do. To be a Joe, not a Mo. All right, let's stand. <coughs> we'll be dismissed in a word of prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, we do thank you for just the privilege of Lord, it would be great to stand up here and, and teach these things because we've got them all figured out, but we don't. But Lord, I'm so thankful that you're still working on me. And God, those days when I'm more of Mo than I am Joe, God, gently correct me on those things. Lord, I know you're a patient God. Lord, but help me to be more of a Joe. God, Lord, to share those smiles, words of encouragement. God, Lord, to let my light shine for you. God, Lord, and expect nothing in return but just do it for you. Because I know one day God will receive the glory. Lord, we thank you and we praise you. We pray your blessings upon each one that's here, all these many requests that was mentioned at the beginning of service, God. Lord, go with us, lead us, and guide us and direct us. In your name we pray. Amen.